now Looking to the East. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. Steve Zercher, the regular host of Looking to the East. He came in from uh, Kobe, yep. and now he's here in Honolulu with Alan Miner of Hi. Sunbridge Capital. Hi, Alan. Hi. Nice to see you. Good to see you. You guys are great because you're here for a an entrepreneurial conference, what, at the Hilton? Right. Uh, and it's the East Meets West Conference. Mm -hmm. uh, Shanoa Farnsworth sets it up. Right. Uh, and uh, it's very important uh, that she does this, very important that people like you guys, who are both into uh, entrepreneurship and venture capital, that you come here and mm -hmm. attend. And so today we're going to have a report from you guys about what right. happened yesterday at this conference. Okay. Alan, why don't you go first? What sure. happened? Well, the first thing is I was surprised. Uh, I, I came mostly because I love spending time in Hawaii. Uh, I've been on panels for a lot of these conferences, hosted a few over the years, and to be totally honest, I didn't have a lot of expectations for the content or for the startups pitching at the event. I was like, no, it's, it's Hawaii. I'll go, have a great time, spend time on the beach the day before and the day after. I was amazed with the quality of the content and actually myself learned quite a few things, particularly there was a mor morning session by a speech led by a lady out of Portland that defined an alternative goal for the startup ecosystem to creating unicorns. Her name was Mara Zepeda, uh, and she and a few of her colleagues from Portland several years ago became very concerned about some of the sexual predatory behaviors that were happening that we were hearing about at Uber and some of the crazy uh, waste of money at places like WeWork on private schools for the founder and wave pools and uh, huge questionable pro potential for profit ever with the way the country is, but carrying valuations in the billions of dollars. And so he said there's something fundamentally wrong about a, a startup culture and a finance culture that can see these as models to strive to replicate as opposed to problems that need to be solved. And so she and a few colleagues published a paper three or four years ago they called the Zebra Manifesto saying maybe we shouldn't be doing unicorns which are creatures that theoretically don't exist and are mystical and magical. We, we should probably be doing something a little more ordinary. And so she defined a type of startup, a type of goal for the studies that they call zebra companies. And part of the zebra metaphor comes from black founders, female founders, more variety in the types of founders that we support, more variety and sustainability and community centricity for the businesses, um, that, that something fundamentally needs to change. And I'd, I'd been struggling with the emergence of the unicorn idea in Japan because I had seen some of the problems that I saw uh, with, with that approach to startups in the U.S. And I did not want the Japanese to go chasing it just because it was getting a lot of attention and hype in the valley. And so as people started talking, about, we need more unicorns in Japan. There are unicorns in China. There are unicorns in Silicon Valley. We need some in Japan. So that's a path we really don't want to go down here. But I didn't, I didn't have a framework to think about the alternative. I didn't have a good alternative answer until yesterday when, I, when they brought Mara here to the event and she laid out their thinking about the kinds of things we probably should be trying to do more of as a startup ecosystem. That's, it, it, feels, it feels so close to the way the Japanese treasury think about the role of business in society and the way a lot of the founders there think about their mission as people, leading people to serve other people and to have a positive impact in the world. Anyway, the, the, so there was a, f a fair discussion with some of the people about whether or not she was maybe too left wing in her too left wing in her thinking. You know, is is this maybe a little bit extreme? But I think we pay attention to extremes, and and we like we like simple metaphors that we can get our hands. And so, not a unicorn, a zebra. It, it's a simple, <laughs> memorable metaphor. Yeah. It's a clear and and possibly extreme view. Of it. But I think we always need to have a few extreme views competing in the marketplace of ideas to have alternatives that have been thought through clearly and argued for eloquently uh, to think about alternate ways. And, and so that for me, that session alone was worth the trip to Hawaii. And then in the afternoon, we can get it. We, we can let you have you, maybe you react, Steve. We'll look, at, look at each other in our windows. Um, but there was there was another session in the in the afternoon that for me personally was enormously insightful and helpful and educational. Anyway, it was well worth the trip. The presentation, the pitches in the afternoon, the guest speakers. But if if Sheno and the team have been doing this for six years and continue sustaining it for another six years, there's bound to, it's bound to have a really positive impact on the startup scene here in here in Hawaii. Steve, your reactions. 
Well, yeah, this is, I think, the third one that I've gone to, and um, I also enjoyed the event very much and the quality of the outside speakers that came to the state and those that are clearly interested in developing uh, the uh, infrastructure here uh, for entrepreneurship. Uh, that was very impressive. Um, but I have to say that uh, over the years I've heard the same message. Um, many of these successes were outside of Hawaii, and they're kind of coming to Hawaii to explain about their story. Uh, and there's still the kind of sense of that we're, we're still missing something here in the state. Uh, we don't have the uh, iconic success that various locations in the United States and outside of the United States now, because entrepreneurship is taking off on a worldwide basis. Sweden is a perfect example of that. Uh, lots of very high valuation companies being generated there in Stockholm. Um, <clears throat> so that's a story that I've continued to hear uh, through that. It's disappointing that, that we're not... It doesn't seem to be that we're making progress uh, in the state on that. Um, now, they did have a, a business pitch, and uh, that was well done. Um, the three companies that won, one was from Hong Kong, uh, one was local and had been assisted by Blue Hawaii and through the accelerator program. That was called Turnover B&B. Uh, they did a very good job with the presentation. They came in second. Mm. Uh, the team that came in first was actually a very small startup that was uh, categorized as being from Japan, but the student who started this business actually went through the UH Hawaii system. I talked with them later. So in a sense, it's kind of a Hawaii company, but they incorporated for various business reasons in Japan. So you had a winner from Hong Kong, you had a winner locally, and then you had a winner from Japan, just to give you a sense of kind of the mix of uh, the uh, companies that were pitching and the ones that the judge has selected. I know Alan had some mm. interest in some of them. One was uh, a recycling company, uh, the one from Hong Kong, uh, and also one that we thought was might be interesting in terms of a collaboration with Japan was called Aloha Hospitality. Uh, they have a, a temporary service for the hospitality industry, but focusing on trying to train uh, the people who are working in the gig on the gig basis uh, to provide higher levels of service and focus on culture. So that was an interesting startup for us to see. So overall, it was a good show, but I was still left with this feeling like deja vu. You know, I want to react. I want to react to that uh, because as soon as you said it, it seemed like the same thing I've been hearing every year. They keep saying the same thing, saying the same thing. I don't feel like progress is being made. There, there's a really uh, famous uh, proverb in Japan which is uh, keizoku wa chikara nari. And it means persistence becomes power. And so I think continuing, no matter how long it takes, continuing to do this event every year, continuing to communicate the same message until some, something happens somewhere that changes. And it's very hard to force change to happen, but it, it's not so hard to recognize it when it begins to happen. And until it happens, you have to keep, to keep tilling the soil, keep watering the plants, uh, keep waiting for which seeds are going to sprout, uh, and so I think I think yeah. the, the persistence and consistency of continuing to communicate the same message, continuing to bring the, operate the same kind of event. I tend to believe, as the Japanese do, that, that persistence will result in a powerful outcome. At some right, point. I, I agree. I mean, it's very important what they've done, and it was a very impressive show. It's like you're you're tilling the soil and you're putting the fertilizer out there, and you're waiting uh, for, for the first the, sprouts to yeah, exactly. Appear. So uh, one thing. That also I heard again, and, and uh, Alan and I were talking about that earlier. They, they, the people at the conference, and most of the organizers, were talking about successful locations in uh, not the most familiar places yeah, like San yeah. Francisco, New York, or Austin. Uh, and they talked about Utah. Yeah, Utah came up several times yesterday. Yeah, they did. So that came up as an example. So Utah uh, has been able to create a very vibrant tech community there. And uh, Honolulu or Hawaii people looked at that because the thought is, well, if the state of Hawaii and the state of Utah, we could potentially do that as well. And I know, Alan, you, you have long roots in Utah. Yeah, so explain every, how that happened. The, well, I, I've been hearing, I've been observing and hearing about the, the current state of Utah and how far it has come in entrepreneurship. And having grown up there in Provo, Utah, where half the population are students at Brigham Young, and the other half of the students are somehow affiliated with Brigham Young. The other half of the students, it's like a Brigham Young University town. Um, and I, I've heard, been hearing about it, trying to think, like, well, what happened? At what point in Utah did this begin to happen? And I can, I can point back to some very specific events from my high school and, and freshman year in college days when the IBM PC was introduced. And there was a professor 
teaching assembly programming and a brilliant computer science student said, we should build a word processor for these PCs. Word processors run on expensive mini computers, and they had actually been doing work for the neighboring city of Orem to custom write a word processor for their data general mini computer. And I was, I was as a freshman, assisting Drew Major, who became the architect and brains behind the Novell network operating system. I was assisting him to write a word processor for a QM mini computer, uh, which was a, uh, they had something called a daisy wheel printer where the, num the letters spin around and you get different fonts by replacing the wheel. And this was a California company that had, that had asked Brigham University to uh, develop a word processor. So I, there were two word processors happening for mini computers. When the PC came out, they said, oh, we can build a word processor for the PC. Less expensive, more people could use it. And that became WordPerfect, which until Microsoft Word was rolled out and tied so tightly to the operating system, until Microsoft dominated PC software, WordPerfect became huge, a huge global company. Mm -hmm. And Novell did the same. They said, well, we can, we can figure out how to get PCs to talk to each other and share data easily. Maybe there's something interesting there. And so those two companies, started by professors and students as the PC was born, uh, were both successful. They learned how to sell software globally, to do product management, engineering, sales, raise funding. Uh, created a significant amount of local wealth that went back into combinations of philanthropy and angel investing and new startups. So those, the, the success of those two companies as the PC was rolled out formed the backbone for what is happening in Utah. So by the time the internet bubble came along, there was a, there was a large cohort of people in the state who understood how to build a successful large global company from scratch and the wealth to support it. My firm yeah. used uh, WordPerfect. Ah, okay. And it ultimately uh, used Novell. Uh -huh. we, were, we were part of that. Yeah, we saw yeah. that all happening. Yeah. And we, we admired what was going on in Utah. Um, but, you know, the question is, uh, mm. you know, you were there. You were, yeah, yeah. you were in that happening. And yeah. I guess the question is what, you know, as you learn from the Japan culture, mm. that persistence pays off. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What can we say that you learned from the Utah experience that would benefit Hawaii or any organ, any any locality you know that's trying to develop a, a tech industry. Well, um, I I would say that that the emergence of Utah came from a ha small handful of very smart people who who in some ways were extremely smart, but at the same time uh, did not consider the power of the computer. They, they, there's a, a fellow a, uh, entrepreneur in Japan once said the only way he could figure out his success and the success of some of his colleagues from college days was that they all have the ability to sustain unjustifiable confidence. So they, they're not particularly brilliant, their ideas were not particularly great, but mm. they, they were able to have confidence with no basis in reality and to sustain, <laughs> sustain that so confidence. Delusional. The delusional <laughs> confidence. Delusional confidence. Would be what say. And it says the, com the common trait of me and my friends was delusional. And I thought, that sounds like Larry Ellison. That sounds yeah. like Mark Benioff. Yeah. That, that, and, and I think, I think, too, I, think you, I think it would apply to the professor and student that started WordPerfect. It would apply yeah. to Drew Major. There, there was never any doubt that what they were building would, would be attractive to customers and that, that people would use it and benefit from it. And no matter what kind of difficulties they may have run into, I, I actually, when I, I was interviewed to join Novell when it was just six people, the two weeks before, uh, this is after I'd done my mission in Japan, returned to Provo, and Drew remembered working with me as a freshman. He says, you should come work with us at Novell. There were six people. I didn't take the job because they had just laid off 200 employees. They had, laid, they had shut down a word processor mini-computer company, uh, and Ray Norda had just bought the company, laid off 200 people, said, this, these six brilliant network engineers are what I'm going to bet the future of the company on. And they had no cash to pay salaries. They couldn't pay me my $6 an hour I wanted as a programmer. Uh, and they said, we'll give you a little bit of stock. We, can, we should be able to raise some money and start paying you a wage, an hourly wage in January. But I thought, I got textbooks to pay for and tuition to pay. I kind of need my $6 an hour. I'm going to go work for them. So I went and worked for another company that ended up going out of it. So I experienced firsthand an attempted startup that failed uh, for lack of ability to raise, continue raising capital and to get traction in the marketplace. So the product didn't sell as well as they thought, and they couldn't raise capital for long enough. While turning down, the company that had just almost gone bankrupt uh, had focused on one thing, doing it well, doing it better than anybody, and, and built a real So I think Novell's ability 
to decide what, where was the future going. The future was not in mini-computer word processing. The future was in the PC and in doing something unique and compelling with the PC. And, and it was networking. And so that we have six people. I can afford to keep paying the salaries of six brilliant engineers. I can't afford to keep the money-losing word processor business going. So that decision to focus on one well-defined emerging opportunity and then both companies' confidence to, so we're just a bunch of students. Like, how do we compete with IBM? Yeah, it was never a question. So we, we've got something, we can build something really powerful and compelling. Yeah, so Steve, you've said that, you've said that uh, there isn't really that much of a tech industry here in Hawaii. Um, and, you know, you're associated with entrepreneurship, the Shiva School. And you can make this cultural comparison between what happens in Hawaii, what happens elsewhere. And I wonder, you know, what's, what's the secret sauce we should be ser searching for. Mm. And was it covered yesterday? Hmm. Um, no, I don't think that particular issue was addressed. And how to encourage a culture of entrepreneurship. Here in Hawaii, yeah, there wasn't much talk about that. No, and I, that's a very important point. I can tell you, and Jay and I have talked about this previously on other broadcasts and also uh, over beers, hmm. that uh, <laughs> the students in my entrepreneurship class when I teach in the summer um, they are interested in starting a business, but, but their vision for it is, is very small scale. And they don't think on a much broader, they don't have this delusional belief or irrational belief in the prospects for a company they would start beyond Hawaii. They seem to be somewhat limited in terms of their focus on tourism and local mm. business. Mm. Um, so I also see that in Japan, frankly. I, I, I recognize talent. I mean, now I'm, I'm utilizing that skill in venture capital, but I also, I've also been hiring people for decades now. Mm -hmm. So I can look at someone, and I can pretty quickly tell, this person is something, someone that I would put a bet on that could potentially do it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I see it here in Hawaii and in Japan, and the students don't even recognize it when I talk. They don't recognize it in themselves. No, they sometimes. don't. So a part of the teacher is uh, to try and encourage students to achieve the level that you see in them. I mean, that's mm. one of the fundamental yeah. things that I focus on as I teach. But Hawaii does have this kind of limited mentality. Maybe it comes from the island culture or the Asian influence to be somewhat risk-averse. So, I, again, this gets back to the point of having a singular success to break through all of these cultural barriers or resistance points that exist in, in Hawaii. If there is a company that is able to do that, um, then people will go, oh, it is possible. But right now, mm -hmm. uh, there's still the thought that this is too difficult to do and not possible yeah. to do. And even if I tell them, you have the ability to be successful on a global basis, my students. So what, what, is, the, what, no. is, what is the, what is the, is, is there a, a big benefit in having a venture capitalist who attends, for example, mm -hmm. uh, a, a program like yesterday? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Steve, you said that uh, Alan was had shown interest, had expressed interest in some of the, mm -hmm. the pitches. Yeah, yeah. So if we're, I'm, we're if I'm Alan or, mm -hmm. or you or any venture capitalist, um, and I'm, uh, I'm pitching, I'm, I have an idea, mm -hmm. I, I may have some level of enthusiasm about it, mm -hmm. uh, and a venture capitalist comes to me and says, mm -hmm. I'm going to wallpaper your firm with money. <laughs> I, I am going to make you feel, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to show you how much I think, you know, you mm. will succeed. Mm. But how much, does that help? Or, or is that just a recipe for a decline? Um, so mm. Alan, mm. unfortunately, he had a dinner appointment. Mm. There was a reception afterwards, and Alan had uh, recognized a couple companies. And I picked a, a one as well, and I talked to all three of them. Um, so one uh, seemed to understand the potential that I was uh, offering them in terms of a collaboration in Japan and the market opportunity in Japan. Mm -hmm. Another one was kind of, uh, this is coming out of the blue, and the response was kind of neutral. And the third one was totally unprepared <laughs> and really mm. didn't understand what I was talking to them about or mm. what this could potentially mean. So it was a little bit all over the map. Now, are we going to continue conversations with them? Yes, we are despite the kind of um, not so strong response to investment and also the opportunity to take these products or services to Japan. But we did it, and uh, we're going to move forward yeah. with this, and maybe it will result in these companies establishing successful presence in Japan and maybe using that to become more global. One of them was a local uh, company. One was uh, the other two were, were foreign that mm -hmm. were outside of Hawaii. Mm -hmm.
So, so although one of the, the foreign ones you said, it's a UH graduate. So yes. maybe once he gets his, he's still it's only two people. Yeah. Uh, and once he gets some traction around product in Japan, if if he were interested in moving back to Hawaii, it's a purely technological play. The, the sales and marketing headquarters does, does not need to be near the customers. It could be anywhere. Right. And there's probably the kind of talent he would need to build the technology is recruitable here in Hawaii. So depending on how strong his personal connection to Hawaii still feels, mm -hmm. I, could, I could imagine being just as comfortable investing in his business if he chose to move it back to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And just have a sales office on the mainland and in Tokyo, mm -hmm. as if he stayed in Tokyo. I think for the for getting getting the first few customers, it's helpful to be close to them while you're building it. But he's small enough that a move of the full team back to Hawaii, mm -hmm. if it was something that that he might like as a life choice, is something I could totally get behind. Um, well, in, in, in this in this world of SaaS. Uh, there are a couple of companies that, if if my instincts about the idea are reinforced by my conversations with the people and, and their personalities, and and there is there's one which it's a very very extremely interesting company. If it's for real, but it's it's one that I approach with a lot of skepticism. You know, if this is for real, it should be everywhere already. Sort of, and you see those now and then. And I always check them out. I always want to understand and not walk away from them just because it sounds crazy. Because I, I believe that every once in a while the biggest things in tech sound crazy at the beginning. And you always should talk to them and, and until, you, until you have understood why it really is crazy, why it's not economical or maybe technically feasible but not economically feasible. Maybe it's you technically feasible. You yeah, I pointed. I, I say, well, this, when they, this is. When they pitch to yeah. you, you tell them this is yeah. crazy. I say, crazy good or crazy so bad. Does it sound I, like the Shark Tank thing? Are maybe, you, yeah, you uh, maybe, maybe, Tank? maybe, maybe. Yeah, you so seem like a nice person. No, yeah. I may be too nice. I may, I may be too nice. I may be too nice. There's actually there's actually a company I'm working with in Japan right now that I'm extremely skeptical about. But I also, from my years in software, I know that if it can be proven that this really works the way the founder, the scientist claims it is, it will be huge. Everyone will be using it to build their software. But it, I find it extremely incredible that it, it's essentially he claims, I have software that can take any existing software product, and al analyze it, restructure it a little bit, and prove that there are no bugs in the software. Wow. And so I said, yeah, sure you can. Uh, it would be wonderful if you can. And so I went into the initial meeting and said, I just, and they're old guys who, it's an old scientist and it's an ex IBM, a retired IBMer and a retired, so it's, it's a bunch of old guys, which also I find a bit skeptic, a bit questionable. But they're, they're really enthusiastic about it. And I said, well, I'm coming to the first meeting. He says, you need to know, I only believe there's a 1% chance you can do what you really want to say. And your job today is, is to move that 1% to 2%. And if you can, if you can convince you that there's a two percent chance that what you have is for real, then I'll take more meetings so we can figure out if, if we, if, if I eventually invest or how we how we grow it together. And, and they persuaded me, not with any kind of technical, because the team was all very technical. And here's the algorithm, here's the mathematical proofs that this is true, and da da da. And it's been proven mathematically. And yeah, I've heard that a hundred times before. I've heard that about perpetual motion machines. How many times? I don't know. Um, <laughs> And I, but but I actually I actually I actually no, take no investments there. I, I no I haven't yet I haven't yet. But I, I I will I will continue to always take at least one meeting with someone who claims to have invented the perpetual motion machine. Uh, and I know the phys, I know the physics says it's not true. But there are plenty of things that physics and science were saying were not possible, not conceivable at some point. That yeah. turned out to actually something in the something in the underlying hypo, assumptions and paradigm for the physics of that day. Turned out to be incorrect. Your so, reaction so, to their project, to their yeah. pr a product, can be very valuable for them. Sure, I mean, even sure. without any venture capital at all. Well, and the, and the fact that they were will, they were willing to take, so they end up having me name the company for them in the last meeting we had. So we were there. So, so what 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 convinced me to have continue having meetings with them is they had had one very who seems to be a very reasonable, credible senior executive from one of the biggest systems integration firms in Japan said, we're going to use this and see how it works on a project. We're going to pick a project, use it, see what the impact is. And so basically what, each meeting we have, we get together once a month and he tells me the progress of the project. How much have they done? What's the result so far? Does it appear like it's going to produce? And, and he's quite positive that it may in fact dramatically reduce their cost of maintaining software. And if not, maybe not eliminate all bugs, but dramatically reduce the number of bugs that are introduced every time they introduce new features to software. So they're actively evaluating it right now. So the fact that there's an act, a customer actively evaluating it, 
who can give me a customer's point of view on whether this really adds value to their development process it or not. It's one meeting. It's a series. It's a series. Meetings. We get together once this a month. This is a dynamic yeah, process. Yeah, we get together so once a month. How much progress they've made. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I want to see that they're continuing to making progress. Um, and at some point, right now, I'm, I probably believe about 15% now. This is for real. Mm -hmm. And if I get to a point where I believe where I have a 35, 50% belief that it, that it is real in terms of value added, then I, I understand how you could build the development structure for how much to fund it, how to market it, how to position it in the market. So, Steve, so there's they, a lot of value I can bring. Do but they need Alan? Early. Do they really need Alan? They need Alan. Because, because you know, they always say, I mean, I, when, when I started getting interested in They don't need my money. If, 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 if what they have is for real, they'll figure out how to sell it. My question it. is the money, yeah. though. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, you, you no. spoke before, Alan, about how in Utah, the experience mm. was uh, bootstrap, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, anything but a venture capital contribution. Yeah. Uh, can I can I make a company uh, in the modern well, way there was. without any venture capital? Mm. So we'll just get back to the bootstrapping uh, one question we had or we mm. were talking about earlier. Yes, it's possible to do that, but you don't need to do that because there is just so much money out yeah. there right now. That is no longer an issue. Um, well, and there was there was venture capital behind WordPerfect and Novell. Once the products had been proven to some point in the market, and they said this could be really big, we need to hire our sales and marketing organization quicker than we can do that through organically financing it. So, when 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 the business got to a point where they said this could be really really big, but it will be bigger, faster, and will survive longer if we can grow faster than we could organically. Right. And so. It started bootstrapped, and the biggest and best internet companies in Japan all bootstrapped at the beginning, and then, and you know there there are, yeah, I, I think I think the best companies are almost always bootstrapped right. to a point. But now in Japan, there's a tremendous amount of venture capital. Yeah, there is. So, just getting back to Shark Tank, the the session closed with Cassidy Crowley, who was this ah, yeah, student presented there. who yeah. was on Shark yeah. Tank and wowed the judges there. So. I have to say, the influence of Shark Tank on entrepreneurship, especially with my students, is yeah. huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The number of <laughs> students taking entrepreneurship class have gone up 50% nationwide in the United States because of that program. Interesting. So yeah. I, I, I don't have, know necessarily that's a good thing, but it certainly had a profound effect on education <laughs> for our entrepreneurship. I was really sad. I had to leave for the dinner before that. And, and so I want to end with a question. Do you think Casada could potentially become the word perfect? To Novell, the, the, pers the person that, that mm. creates the first huge tech success out We'd of Hawaii. We'd have to wait. She's only 10. <laughs> <laughs> She's in elementary school, so but she certainly would be a candidate for that breakthrough entrepreneur for this state. and uh, Just a wonderful accomplishment for her at 10 years old. Well, we need this. We need to focus on it. We as a country, and for that matter, we as the world. Mm -hmm. uh, this mm -hmm. is the future of developing business and making Absolutely. our our society sustainable. Um, it's the way of dealing with social issues, as you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Some of these speakers dealt with social issues. Uh, and you guys, both of you, are in a situation where you can have a tremendous effect on that generation of entrepreneurs that's coming up. And they, in turn, can have a tremendous effect mm -hmm. on our world. Anyway, thank you very much, guys. Uh, yeah, thank thanks you. for having us. Ed and Alan is going to be the Paul Chung speaker. Oh, yes, this yes. Summer, right. and so, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. For a late August. And Steve and I are going to continue our looking from the east. Mm -hmm. uh, every couple of weeks on Monday, we are so excited about connecting uh, with him in Japan. And wherever he goes, you can run, Steve, but you cannot hide. <laughs> okay. Thank you both very much show. for appearing today. Thanks so much. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, excellent. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha.